When we're looking at this issue today, I do want to make a first initial point that the prejudice that is targeting our community today is nothing new on the American landscape. And I think sometimes when we're experiencing the prejudice that comes after our community, sometimes when we're seeing things on the news or hearing about things from friends, we forget that this is the same hate as has been going on for years. We're just one of the newer targets. And that will become very important toward the end of my presentation as we talk about things that we can do to deal with the problem. But what I want to look at first and foremost is if we're going to talk about institutionalized Islamophobia, we must, as Dr. Bazian was pointing at, look at the state. And in this case, the Trump administration, because that's the newest piece of the state, as it were. And I'm going to say something that maybe the other panelists will disagree with me on. If, if I'm right and they do disagree with me, that's good for you, because we'll be screaming at each other in a minute or so. But I would argue to you that Donald Trump is not ideological in his hatred of Islam. He is transactional in everything that he does in my observation. Meaning that he is going to say and do whatever is necessary to get him what he wants on that particular day. So it's not, in my opinion, that he hates Muslims because you saw when King Abdullah of Jordan came over, all of a sudden the whole, we need to call it radical Islamic terrorism, went away. And he was like, this guy is my best friend. So it doesn't, from Trump, look ideological. That is not a saving grace. But what it does mean is if you think about it, if politically, if you can raise the consequence of Islamophobia to a high enough political temperature, then somebody who is transactional may look at something else as a way to advance their goals. What you do have in the Trump administration is many staff members who ideologically believe that Islam is the enemy. And many of you know this, but I will just talk about a couple so that we just have some sense of what we're talking about. Kellyanne Conway, spokesperson that we all have seen many times, Trump campaign manager. When you saw the Muslim ban back in 2015, the original policy announcement, a press release that accompanied that announcement cited an organization called the Center for Security Policy. We'll talk about them in a moment. A well-known anti-Muslim group. But it was Kellyanne Conway that did the poll for Center for Security Policy that the Trump campaign cited to justify its Muslim ban. So you're talking about an individual who has been working closely with the anti-Muslim network for years in a position of close proximity to the president. Similarly, I don't think it's a shock to anybody in the room, Steve Bannon has written things that advance this conspiracy theory that all Muslims are in this country to undermine the Constitution of the United States. He is the founder of the alt-right movement, and I would just advise you, let's not even look at it as alt-right, they're white supremacists, let's call them what they are, end of the story. There are other groups under that banner, but they're white supremacists. They're just looking for a way to call themselves something that doesn't have that old, detested label on them. So you have people like, a number of people who ideologically dislike Muslims, and then you have some other figures, like the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, Kelly, who I would argue to you, I don't see anything Islamophobic in his past in terms of statements he's made, but he is willing to go along and implement the Muslim ban. So you have people that are transactional, you have people that are ideological, and you have people that are just going to be willing to go along in this administration. A couple of things to keep in mind about the administration, though, and, and institutionalized Islamophobia. They are new to this. And you see this in every administration. When they come to power, when you get elected, they will make a lot of mistakes early on. And this administration has done that times 10. A lot more than we usually see. But when you look at the original wording of the first Muslim ban, that is a group of people who are new to running government. 
They didn't put it through the vetting. They didn't think it through the way they, that it needs to be thought through. So I would argue to you that we're going to see the level of sophistication of their ability to implement institutional Islamophobia as we move forward. They are learning on the job. They will have some hiccups, but they will figure it out. And I will argue to you, I have always been one to avoid the notion that the war on terror is a war on Islam. I think there's a lot of nuance and complication there. But we now do have people in this administration who I think are going to make a very serious effort to convert, you know, let's still call it the war on terror, but convert it into Huntington's notion of a clash of civilizations. They are still looking for the old Soviet Union. They want something like communism to focus on. So what does that look like moving forward? And I think the first and really the clearest thing that we've seen so far, the Obama administration's Countering Violent Extremism Initiative. For years they have said, we want to prevent violent extremism in this country, and our program focuses on everybody. Violent extremists of all types. White supremacists, anti-government militias, people who claim Islam sanctions their actions. But we've all always known that that was not the actual case. When you went to all three pilot cities for the Obama administration's program, Boston, Minneapolis, Los Angeles, and you went to the tables where they were coming up with the ideas, it was not a table full of anti-government militia, white supremacists, and Muslims talking to the government. It was all Muslims that were being invited to these things. Have no doubt. But the Trump administration is just simply going to do away with those facades. So one of the first things that we heard coming out of DHS is they're going to rebrand the CVE program as something like countering violent Islamism or countering violent jihad. Lots of names have been thrown around. So the facades are going to drop away very quickly. And what we've already seen is this unshackling of institutions like Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, and the Transportation Security Administration. It's not like the staff of these two institutions suddenly changed overnight. And yet, suddenly, in a very quick period from the Obama administration to the Trump administration, you have these institutions saying and doing things that constitutionally are highly problematic. So what you saw in the enforcement of Muslim Ban 1 to American citizens like Muhammad Ali Jr. being stopped by Customs and Border Protection and asked questions that had no relevance to why was he traveling and what did he do while he traveled. The questions were, how did you get that name? Right? And what is your religion? So these are the same staff people working for ICE, working for TSA. But it's clear that something has been changed in the protocols and ways they're going to operate. I also expect that what we're going to see is we have already seen in society post-Trump election a jump in discrimination cases. So in the first week after the election, CARE counted 111 different incidents of discrimination in which Muslims were targeted because of what we identified as being election backlash. We normally see 30 cases total in a month. So that gives you some sense of what we saw, and you also saw it against other communities. No doubt, a jump in aggression against people of Latino, Hispanic origin, a jump in people of the Jewish faith, a jump in cases targeting African Americans. I would argue to you that now one of the things we're going to see is a jump in cases related to the federal government. Makes sense. Right before the election, we saw Trump supporters making threats against the safety and security of people, threatening Hillary Clinton. We saw people targeting Muslims, actually arrested for planning to blow up Somali Muslims. And there was a rumor that Al-Qaeda might be thinking about doing something. And what we saw is a jump in FBI visits to members of the Muslim community, but no equivalent jump in FBI visits to Trump supporters, 
or people that would be targeting the Muslim community. And the questions that we saw the FBI asking in the run-up to the election were things like, if you knew of a plot, would you report it to us? As if, like, we haven't been doing that for years, guys. So I think you're going to see more of that. I think you're going to see more of the federal government becoming far more intrusive into the lives of American Muslims. Our, our, our mentors from the civil rights era in, this, in the United States have been giving us some very good advice, reminding us that when the government chooses to come after a community, it's not always done through the lens of just terrorism in this case, right? You heard Dr. Bazian mention how Martin Luther King was targeted and called a communist. But what they did to civil rights era leaders is went after them for if you didn't cross an eye on your taxes or something like that. So I think we can expect to see more targeting of the community that way. And we have already seen a case that may be one of the first incidents of that in staff members of American Muslims for Palestine were protesting something. A number of other people uh, of different skin colors were arrested and it was the white folks with skin like mine were essentially given a slap on the hand and let go. The folks who were Arab from American Muslims for Palestine are being gone after by prosecutors. So an uneven enforcement of the law, which I think to any American should be repulsive. The whole country is built on the notion, that at least the ideal, maybe we don't always live it, but the ideal that the law applies equally to everybody. We're going to see also more things like the Muslim ban. That first Muslim ban, when you look at the way it was written, terrible. I mean, anybody who knows anything about the law saw those lawsuits coming. I think you're going to see more of it, but as I've already said, I think it's going to be smarter. All right, so I've depressed the room, right? Are you guys really thoroughly down now? I have that effect. I'm sorry about that. What to do about it, though? I want you to think about this because I want you to get a sense of the power that you have at an event like this and just in general in society. Think back to right after the 9-11 attacks, the Patriot Act was rammed through Congress. There were no lawsuits that were really visible. Terrible piece of legislation, right for constitutional challenges. There were no marches in the streets against the Patriot Act. And yet, after the Muslim ban came out, you saw not the ACLU care civil liberties groups. You saw states, Washington, Hawaii, going after this thing. So the playing field today is very different. We are no longer alone, and our level of legal sophistication has grown. Organizations that are tasked with defending you also are much stronger. Our colleagues at the ACLU, after the election, reported that in two days, they raised the equivalent of what they normally raise in four years. At CARE, I can tell you we had 5,000 people volunteer to help us out in the first month after the election. We could not handle it. It's a great problem to have. I feel bad that we didn't have the infrastructure to be able to use all those volunteers. And I think that, as I've already hinted at, we're definitely less isolated. So, Look at Inauguration Day, the crowds on the, the mall. Look at the next day at the women's marches. Now, I, I know we're close to Washington, D.C. I don't know how, did anybody here participate in the women's march? You couldn't walk forward, backward, sideways. I was getting crushed all day long. I thought I was on, hud, on hudge. It was great because it was a moment of energy. And right now, there are good people working to take that moment of energy and turn it into a movement that will last and have an impact. So when I talk about all that stuff in the beginning, it sounds bad, but remember, we are not the first community to get targeted. And all these other communities, because they stood up and were irritating, have been able to provide us 
with laws that protect us, provide us with movements that protect us. So as we talk about, okay, fine, these are some of the great things in the environment, what are we gonna do about it? One of the first things I want you to think about is join with someone. You're already doing that by being here at ICNA this weekend. But look at several different groups, find groups that are doing work that you like, sign up for their lists, and when they ask you to do something, do it. It usually takes five minutes. But here's the fascinating thing. If I, Corey Saylor, call my member of Congress, it's like, yeah, that's great. We get 100 of you guys a day. If 30 of us call our member of Congress, it's not a really large number. They will go, whoa, something's going on here. If I call a corporation, and I say, look guys, what you're doing is discriminating against Muslims, I'd like you to stop. I have literally been laughed at and hung up on. And then I send out a press release or an action alert and I say, hey folks, call this corporation, let them know politely that you don't like what they're doing. And then the CEO, I've literally, I've had it where I was hung up on and then we started a campaign and I kid you not, the CEO was on the phone looking for me a few hours later. That's because people like you decided to do something. Be visible as well, so be a part of something. If you haven't visited with a member of Congress, the United States Council of Muslim Organizations is holding their Hill Day in a couple of weeks. You don't need to be an expert. Be willing to walk into one of these offices and talk to these people. They deal with people all the time. They want to hear from them. The number one complaint we get from members of Congress is I never hear from Muslims. Let's change that. Last year, these pe people visiting with USCMO met with more than a third of Congress. And Congress pays attention to those kind of things. It's a lot of fun to watch Capitol Hill suddenly look Muslim. Makes a lot of them nervous. We want them to be nervous. We want them to know that they have voters, donors, constituents that are willing to take time and come and hold them accountable. Why didn't you vote? in favor of this legislation I like. Also in your local community, and this goes back to the opening of my remarks, and I'll make Naeem happy by wrapping up, or Dr. Bukhari happy by wrapping up here. If you think about our faith, if you think about Sharia, that term that's really been taken away from us, what are the two goals of Sharia? Be a benefit to humanity, avert harm from humanity not be a benefit to Muslims, avert harm from Muslims. We live in a society with a lot of social ills. One of the best lessons I ever learned was right after 9-11, I went to a leader in the African American community. I said, look, we really need your help with racial profiling. And he looked at me and he said, I don't remember seeing you at the table when we needed your help. Embarrassing for me, absolutely, but a fair point. If we as Muslims believe our faith says be a benefit to humanity, then we need to be out there being a good ally. It's not show up at the Black Lives Matter movement and say, hey guys, the Muslims here are to rescue you. It's show up and say, what do you need from us? Need us to turn out the local mosque? We'll do it, and then do it. By being involved in these social justice movements, we get the opportunity to make sure that these communities that have stood up and protected us by giving us things like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which we at CARE use every day to protect clients, we may get the opportunity to make sure that these communities that have given us laws and rules that we use when a mosque gets burned down to go after the person who perpetrated the crime, we get to make sure that we expand those laws and that we add those protections because I guarantee you, based on the history of the United States, prejudice will go to somebody else in the future. I don't know who it's gonna be, but it always does. Someone else will be in the lens. And we want whoever is next to be in the lens to look at the Muslim community and goes, those guys stood up, those guys protected us, and we're safer today because they made the sacrifices necessary at the time. So thank you and I look forward to questions.